So, hi everybody for the second time. Um, I'm going to cover a bit of uh, new stuff that we have uh, already done and, and some of you are uh, probably already aware in 4.13 but also cover uh, a couple of new really interesting things uh, in 4.14 uh, and, and things like that. Um, I, I do have a slide with, with our company on this one. So again by two words of me uh, working at ShareBlue as Cloud Architect yada 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 you saw everything in the previous presentation so I won't bother you with the details uh, you all know about ShareBlue so I again won't be bothering you with reading the stuff some of our customers uh, a couple of sound names some of those are not on that slide for <coughs> NDA reasons and stuff but that's pretty much it right so uh, in 413 I would say uh, I was pretty involved in some of the testing uh, uh, simply by helping out uh, this was a release which was very rich with a, a couple of uh, new general features irrelevant of the hypervisor as well as some things around VMware now in 4.13, which we're going to see some of the new things that we are cooking for 4.13, uh, there are a lot of new things for KVM. So there is a bit of, uh, uh, of everything for, for all the hypervisors, if you're on Zen servers, sorry, no, no new things for Zen this time. Right, so um, new stuff in 4.13. Uh, this is just a high level thing I'm going to cover in details most of those uh, some of those which I'm not covering I'll, I'll kind of cover right now on, on this slide so we have ability to have constraints or, or bounded if you like custom offerings so you can say the customer can use the custom offering uh, computer offering but only between 1 and 10 CPU cores so the customer cannot go not go really wild or you can say it can only, the customer can only provision a VM with a custom offering between one and maybe eight gigabytes, no more. Uh, we have ability to have networks which aren't charged for, so if you have some kind of service network, backup network, monitoring and stuff like that, you don't want that to be, uh, the, uh, to, that your customer is charged uh, with simply having uh, that network. O o OVA appliance support, I'm gonna be explained in more details. Ability to create uh, different kind of offerings uh, which are uh, dedicated or visible uh, only to specified domains or zones again going to be explained later ability to, sex, uh, to set tags when creating resor resources like uh, uh, manually snapshots or snapshot policies again you're going to see details uh, VMware 67 support uh, simply we do provide uh, do provide support or can now uh, fully consume VMware 6.7 we sphere 6.7 if you like there is a bunch of uh, guest operating system mappings which were cloned from the version 6.5 and some new ones which are specific to 6.7 were added uh, we have better support for uh, UI branding gonna see that um, the thing that I'm not going to explain is DPTK live migrations <coughs> and offerings uh, uh, effectively in the 4.11 I believe we introduced uh, DP, uh, support for DPDK if you're using KVM with OVS so you can use DPDK enabled VMs now we are extending that support <coughs> in both API and GUI uh, to support live migrations uh, and uh, do some more proper DPDK properties let's say related things in the offerings um, so that's something uh, let's say interesting well, at least for some uh, people uh, we also now support multi-disk OVA upload from local which is via your browser so far you could upload multi -disk in 4.11 only when you register it from the web server now we support that also when you upload from via your browser from your laptop uh, uh, and also we support ISO upload from a uh, local again from your laptop and keep in mind this is all 4.13 this which is already out like almost two months ago so uh, that's a bit uh, about it and let's cover some of those uh, more specifically or if you like to see all the new stuff uh, please go to the specified URL where you can actually see like probably 200 commits or something like that right constraints uh, constrained custom offerings so you can set a minimum uh, number of uh, minimum number of CPU cores and maximum number of CPU cores and the customer will have a fancy slider to select within those boundaries same goes for the amount of memory not more than one uh, gigabyte for example in this in this specific example those are custom uh, constrained and the previously what was named custom we just renamed to uh, or well we didn't <coughs> rename but we kind of uh, we can no name those as custom unconstrained so whatever are the global limits or whatever the hypervisor can do just do that don't limit it as part of the offering over here 
So this is global, obviously nothing to do with specific hypervisors, so that's uh, for everybody, let's say. Uh, we have a possibility to hide IP usage on a shared network, when you, uh, some of you guys certainly have uh, probably shared network connected to multiple uh, customer VMs, although they are maybe mainly on, the, on their isolated networks and stuff like that. So we, you can share uh, IP address usage, so those are, the IP addresses are not charged to the customer, because that's the network you implement as the, uh, for a managed service, not the customer really themselves. Uh, OVA appliance support, so in 4.11 we had uh, support for multi-disc OVA, uh, but if you have an, an actual appliance uh, with a bunch of, uh, when you are I'm, I'm talking about uh, v VMware this time specifically, so those are the VApp options uh, as visible in the vSphere, so all those options when you imp import or try to import a template, uh, or actually let me do uh, say it a bit different when you deploy a VM from that kind of template which you previously imported in the new uh, in the other instance wizard you will have a new sec uh, se um, section effectively which will ask you all those questions that are usually that you would usually be asked uh, in uh, vSphere so whatever you pass here those will be uh, passed uh, through to the VM, eventually reported via VMware tools to uh, the hypervisor, uh, sorry, to the guest operating system and so on, so it will work effectively the same way. We'll, we'll just pass those back to the vSphere and whatever it already does here, it will continue to do so. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. Um, some of those devices or many other devices you might have uh, will be, will be uh, you will be possible to utilize that simply by having the actual appliance from some kind of market or whatever you know external uh, when you pay for some uh, of those virtual appliances right uh, then we have a, a possibility to uh, make uh, this compute network and VFC offerings visible or slash dedicated if you like uh, either to be public as they were so far or to be dedicated either for uh, some specific zones all zones a single zone and also you can also make it visible to only uh, let's say some kind of some domain uh, the idea with this is if you have multiple zones you buy your fancy fast storage uh, in only one zone then you want uh, to target that storage via compute offering storage offerings but you say it's available only in this specific zone so you know the the, the those offerings will be visible only when you choose the, that specific zone not in every zone so you cannot have failures in that sense uh, right, um, I need to read how you pronounce this, hereditary tags, all right, uh, on reoccurring snapshots. So uh, when you create a manual snapshot so far, it was not possible to uh, uh, create a tag during creating the snapshots. It was possible maybe later, but not during creation of the snapshot. Now you can do that. Uh, you have a nice form and it's also possible for reo reoccurring snapshots. You will define the tags. Here actually there is some tag, but it's obviously not very visible because it's grayed out. Uh, but this is snapshot policy, let's call it this way. When you create, actually let me zoom that. Uh, when you, uh, this is the setup, so uh, we have some tags defined for the snapshots, right? When you actually produce a snapshot or when the snapshot policy produces the snapshots, uh, those tags will be inherited uh, to all the snapshots created by or from that uh, uh, snapshot policy. <coughs> These are volume snapshots, obviously, but you can additionally add more uh, tags if that's what you like to do. Right, uh, we have also more flexible uh, UI branding. Uh, there is a special config.js file. You can change uh, the browser uh, page slash tab title. Uh, so it doesn't say Apache Cloud Stack or Cloud Stack. You can call it whatever you like. You can change uh, help URL in the about a box. Uh, you can change uh, the name of the keyboards. If it says US keyboard, you can just say US and stuff like that. So a couple of, of things. You can also hide uh, uh, some uh, col columns in some of the metric views like, uh, I don't know, storage metrics or, or something like that, or instance metrics, you can hide some of the columns. Uh, many, 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 many different uh, UI tweaks and updates. Again, you can re re uh, refer to the release notes to actually see what has been expanded, fixed, and stuff like that. Uh, we have shared template support in UI. I'm going to show this on the next slide. And also, as I mentioned, we allow live migration of DPDK instances. We do have some things to fix, uh, which will be hopefully fixed in 4.14. Um, yeah, so this is the shared template support. Actually, it's been there for, for a while, but it was effectively available only via API. So now you can effectively, uh, if you are, a, let's say, an account owner of template, you can share it with uh, either different uh, accounts uh, or 
some other projects as well. The idea is there is a global settings which will say whether this list of other accounts within your domain is visible to you or not. If it's not visible, you will need to actually know the name of the destination account with which you want to actually share this template. It's a security thing, whether you, you this may be okay for private clouds, but, but for public clouds, you definitely don't want to expose a list of different accounts if, if every account is, for example, a different <coughs> tenant. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a thing. You can also add, remove, or you can actually reset. There is also option to reset here from the drop-down menu. There is add, remove from specific ones you choose, or you can just reset permission so it's not shared with anybody. Right, so that was uh, 4.30. Now, hopefully, um, a little bit more interesting things uh, on top of this in 4.14, <coughs> two short demos as well. Uh, right, so we have um, a backup and recovery, which is an uh, old, new feature, uh, never-ending uh, story, but will hopefully be really finished this in this release. The reason is, was because we expanded the scope uh, of what we want to do with it. That's one of the things. The other thing is it might be, uh, it might, you know, went back, went down a little bit on the list of priorities due to other things. But we are, we have scheduled this to be finally, you know, available in 4.14. Uh, we have something called KVM rolling maintenance. I'll explain that. We have KVM DRS for all, all of you uh, VMware uh, gurus. Uh, you are, aware, uh, uh, you know, aware of DRS uh, feature of the VMware. Uh, we also have something like called VR health checks uh, and interesting stuff. Uh, so you learn. Uh, on time if something is, uh, you know, not working inside your virtual router before the help desk uh, becomes red. Uh, we have something very interesting called System VM Management API, a uh, very interesting thing and hopefully we'll, uh, uh, I'm going to explain that, but we'll, you know, make your life easier during the um, management of the different System VM templates during upgrades, clean installation, stuff like that, really good stuff. Uh, we have something uh, called VM ingestion, uh, something that uh, I believe uh, Andre and, and uh, Sebastian, did I, yes. I didn't mistake, I'm sorry, uh, were effectively uh, hinting, um, we are going to explain this, what it is. Uh, effectively, you have your vSphere cluster full of VMs, manually provisioned VMs, and you say import, 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 import into cloud stack, Pfft, all of a sudden after a, single after a single API call, you can manage those VMs as if you created them previously from CloudStack. So very good for current existing clusters to adopt CloudStack, just put CloudStack on top of that, uh, metaphorically speaking, right? Uh, right, so we have also something called during download for system VM templates. I'm not gonna explain further, so I'll just touch this, uh, touch this over here. So starting with 4.11, I believe release, uh, we implemented something called the direct download for templates, user templates. The idea is when you go and register a template from a web URL and you hit register, it's instantly done. What really happens is that template is not downloaded into CloudStack, it's just a database record. When your KVM host, this is specific to KVM as, as, as it says in the parentheses, uh, when your KVM host wants to spin a very first VM, ever from that new template, the KVM host itself will actually go download template and do all the work. Instead of uh, doing KVM image to convert from secondary storage and do all the work on the primary storage, it will just fetch it remotely and do whatever it was doing previously. So that's a good thing. We are going to support this for system VM templates as well. Uh, and so far this was uh, supported only, I believe, with <coughs> NFS uh, storage. Uh, now the idea is to make uh, this, all, this whole story uh, primary storage agnostic. Now, uh, there was a question I got from one of our guys, should we support Gluster? And I said, like, probably not. So we'll, we'll discuss that, obviously, with, with some of our other guys, because it's really, really, really edge case, so it, and it obviously uh, asks for additional effort. But in general, to make it primary storage agnostic, so local storage, NFS, again, this is KVM specific, Ceph, Solid fire. Those are at least four or whatever I counted right now that I personally had in my have in my head. Uh, those are the four majors and, and pre-setup, which is effectively very similar internally as as uh, local storage. So that's something uh, that we want to uh, to also uh, push forward in 414. And also there is, uh, as, as uh, my colleague Steve already mentioned, there is CloudStack Kubernetes service and something which is uh, not really related at the moment with the cloud stack, it's cloud stack Kubernetes provider. So I'll bore you to tears with those abbreviations, CKS, CCS, CKP, and stuff like that in some of the next slides. All right, and on top of this, we have uh, Primate. Mm -hmm. uh, if it renders, 
or if it doesn't render or maybe that's my mistake this one su was supposed to be on top of the whole slide and, and says primate aka rip the old GUI uh, my apologies for 1am uh, mod uh, modification of some of the lines uh, you'll see a demo uh, hopefully very interesting thing some of you maybe have already seen it actually in, in Vegas maybe not but uh, definitely a new thing uh, as uh, Steve men mentioned it had more uh, voting in general but let's say all, all plus one votes on the mailing list then probably that's my comment probably than last two or three releases of cloud stack altogether but uh, so yeah very very positive feedback right uh, kvm rolling maintenance um, effectively the idea is that uh, instead of you going manually put host into maintenance mode they do some doing you know some maintenance of the host then exit maintenance once then you go to next host you just uh, send an api uh, just send an api uh, to the cluster you set the pod in a cluster and you specify some parameters in API call and stuff like that and effectively uh, this API will perform a rolling maintenance of all your KVM hosts in that specific cluster so uh, one of the things uh, it's not as simple as it sounds you as the cloud operator you know what kind of maintenance you like to do what do you like to do do you want to upgrade kernel which requires reboot do you want to just I don't know update some packages which do not require maintenance mode but you know just in case so the idea is that you as a cloud operator will supply uh, upgrade slash patching scripts to the KVM host to a specific folder and the API call uh, will talk to the agent uh, not via SSH but via uh, actual uh, management to, to cloud stack agent connections uh, SSL connection effectively now and it will instruct it to to consume those there are two modes like maintenance mode where you actually want to do the maintenance mode of the host like migrate VMs away it's safe to do whatever kind of work reboot or not and after that exit maintenance mode, maintenance mode and then move to the next host and it's doing it all by its own there is some retrial logic there is some failure logic to be graceful handled and everything was properly uh, thought of uh, there is also a so-called what we call internally noop mode which is not maintenance mode so you just want to update ntp uh, you issue and uh, you, you supply the, the scripts in a specific folder you issue a api call with specific parameters it's a noop mode not maintenance mode and it will go and do its stuff across kvm hypervisors although you could do this actually via ansible or something easier than this but uh, there are some use cases and there, there, there are reasons why this was actually uh, let's say developed so uh, that's in short the kind of KVM rolling maintenance so kind of simplifies the management uh, which do or does or does not require maintenance again depending on your use case uh, then we have something called KVM the, the DRS uh, Effectively, it will mimic, um, in some sense, it will mimic, or at least we try to base this off the VMware DRS, at least the, the details that we can read publicly. Uh, the idea is here that we have two kind of, uh, let's say, algorithms, if you like, or two ways to, to uh, for DRS to run. The first is to balance hosts. So if you have one host full of CPU, you know, uh, allocated CPU, not really used because that changes awful frequently and we cannot rely on that. So amount of allocated CPU, if it's like 90% of one host, 10% on another host, you want this to run so it make it roughly equal 50-50 or something like that. There is some deviation and a configuration, a bunch of configuration settings which will where you specify the allowed deviation. You know, this one can be 51, this can, can be you know 45, I'm happy with that or whatever the numbers now. So the, the deviations is in is percentage base. I'm just giving you kind of a bit plastic example. Uh, or you can actually uh, choose to pack hosts. So if you have 10 hosts, you make sure that you know three, four, five of them are full as possible. The other uh, are actually uh, as free as possible potential with zero VMs. Uh, this reminds me of the defragment in Windows or, or previous systems when you have these small uh, squares moving left and right. Uh, right, so uh, the DRS process is, uh, I was reading the FR, which uh, kind of document that we internally uh, 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 never mind the, the, the design document effectively that's what I want to say and there were some th some things where, where I had to have first two beers to be able to digest what my, one, my, one of our uh, very senior colleagues actually wrote because he took like many many days to write that and uh, it's really complex the whole logic and everything is extremely complex but it's again very well thought of uh, and effectively that's uh, that's the actual feature uh, the, the, the idea with DRS now you might say do <coughs> migrate based Based on uh, uh, CPU allocation, VM allocation, the idea, the idea is the following: We try to calculate cost versus benefit. The cost is 
uh, the benefit, let's say, is CPUs. Uh, we want to benefit from uh, distributing CPUs because RAM is kind of fixed. It doesn't really matter the amount of RAM that is uh, uh, that is uh, kind of, uh, there is no benefit in, in, in some sense. The RAM and potentially storage, if you're running local storage, is considered as a cost. It's much easier to live migrate a VM with one CPU and one gigabyte RAM than, VMU, than v VM with even four CPU but 16 gigabytes of RAM. Or let's say it's easier to migrate VM with four CPUs and one gigabyte of RAM then VM with, uh, with one CPU and 16 gigabytes of RAM. So uh, migrating RAM uh, content over network takes time. Uh, migrating uh, storage uh, from one host to another if you're using local storage takes time. So that's what we try to do. We try to, uh, to choose the least expensive VM for migration from which we will benefit. Least expensive in the sense of the amount of RAM memory or local storage if you're running local storage to migrate away. So it's, it's very, again, it's very well thought of and there are certain configuration parameters where you can make sure that it doesn't run forever and, and things like that. Well, enterprise feature, I, as, I, as I say, without uh, actually enterprise uh, tag, uh, price tag as well. Right, uh, virtual router health checks. Uh, the idea is that uh, we implement uh, specific uh, checks which are running periodically on its own inside the virtual router and the results are stored locally inside the virtual router. Management server will, will pull those results uh, periodically and if there are any failures, it will uh, raise an alert, a login event that things failed and stuff like that. There is also our uh, optional uh, optional uh, configuration setting, if you like, to actually uh, restart the virtual router upon some failure. So uh, out of many checks, which I'm going to uh, mention on the next slide, you can, sell a, you can say I want, for example, my virtual router to uh, restart if I, uh, if I, only if I have DNS, DNS, DHCP config um, in not uh, uh, let's say appropriate way, not configured in appropriate way. So um, we kind of uh, split this into two kind of checks, basic checks and advanced uh, checks and additionally some network sanity checks. So you can effectively see on the slides, so I no reason for me to read every single line, but we do awful lot of checking of different things that we saw from past many years, you know, this thing may fail, that thing may fail, even if it's a bit of edge case, let's implement that check. So effectively you, you are supposed to, uh, as a cloud operator, to learn that something failed before you know in four hours uh, time somebody starts calling uh, uh, help desk because from time to time you will have uh, some kind of issues with your virtual router whether it's read-only file system you had issues with storage you have a read-only file system virtual routers automatically like this almost and let's restart it you know let's not wait for 10,000 customers to, to call in the morning. So that kind of thing and you can also download from uh, on your local laptop from uh, from the uh, from the management server. Right, um, system via management uh, API. So uh, the idea here is that you are able to manage multiple versions of or one if you like but up to multiple versions of system VM templates and choose which one is the active one at any point in time the idea is the following uh, you have uh, you are deploying new zone you need to you guys know you need to proceed the template with a script you need to wait for it to do its stuff and stuff like that why is that if we can only say during the deployment of the zone you good guy management server go and download the system VM from here, from there, from there, or from there. And I'm going to cover those options a bit later on the next slides. Um, so there is no more, uh, there is no more, uh, let's say, um, reason or, or, or uh, to uh, precede the template when you uh, spin the zone. Also, it does allow you to test different security patches. If you have uh, some kind of security patch, you can easily, uh, well, pretty easily automated, rebuild the system VM, have a new template, and then activate it for a second or two, well, a couple of minutes actually, or, or two, to test this on some new virtual routers which we will create, and then revert back after five minutes uh, to other system VM template to be the active one. So you still continue using that. So you can experiment and test different system VM templates. It's really, really nice thing. Uh, how this, uh, uh, before I show you a small GIF created out of the video, uh, you can also explicitly choose one of the existing system VM templates to become active. Only one can be active at any point in time. When, whenever you create system VMs, router, system, secondary storage VM, console proxy VM, it will be created only out of the template which is marked as active if you have multiple system VM templates. Observe the GIF file, explain. So this is a new zone wizard. There is a new section system VM template. 
you can choose the URL from which the management server will download it. Uh, hopefully this will be actually all empty uh, in the final version. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can choose the hypervisor, operating system type and stuff like that that you usually choose for system in templates. You can choose official cloud stack template and then again URLs will be populated. This is Hyper-V over here, Hyper-V over here. Change to, KV, change to KVM, the URL changes. So those are official versions which you are so far have been manually uh, working on. You can copy that if this is a new zone uh, from another zone in the same. You cho choose the zone and from that zone you choose available system VM templates which you want to copy over. So again management server will copy over this via remote zone uh, SSVM. We have also uh, option to upload from local choose different things as usual and, and stuff like that and you can also mark this as active as well. Uh, I believe that's for this specific uh, GIF, yeah, and then we have another, another one, or, or actually two. You can also upload from local. Uh, n normal templates, user templates have a bunch of checkboxes. When you switch to system, those are all gone, and we, ha we have only a few fields to, to effectively you know, populate uh, the usual stuff uh, like you were doing so far. So now we are splitting uh, kind of templates to user and system templates. If you go to add, which is registered from URL, again, user templates, bunch of checkboxes. When you switch over to system VM template or system kind of templates, all checkboxes gone. Again, same story from URL, uh, choosing different parameters as needed uh, from you choose the destination zone, obviously, and stuff like that. But from URL, from official cloud stack templates, URL, uh, again, those are automatically changing as you change the hypervisor. Uh, so that's that's all standard thing that you, you will be doing so far. Again, copy from zone and, and stuff like that. So it's very it's very inter inter interesting because we you don't need to manually, uh, you don't need a human to proceed the template. You are now talk, uh, talking to the management server and telling him, telling it, go and do that stuff instead of a human doing it. So it's very nice. Right, uh, VM ingestion. I, I personally spent quite a bit of uh, time testing this one and it's very interesting stuff. Uh, the whole idea is, you, as I already mentioned previously, you have existing VMware cluster and you want to you want to be able to just import that into cloud stack. So far you know all the all the rules that you need to have empty uh, cluster and you know whatever VMs are there they are happy to run there but we cannot manage them. Obviously there are some prerequisites. Uh, it's effectively the same story as you were adding an empty cluster. Just now you're adding existing cluster which is already populated with VMs. So the vSphere data, data, data center is linked to cloud stack zone cluster hosts and related primary storages on which those VMs are already existing needs to be added to cloud stack. You can do proper tagging as you like and I'll explain how this will affect uh, the actions later. Networks uh, with the same VLAN, VLAN ID needs to be pre-created in cloud stack. If you have manually created network, my backup network on VLAN 700, now you need to spin a new um, uh, network in cloud stack. Uh, optionally choose uh, this VLAN 700 or, or gamble and wait until it's actually that specific VLAN is really chosen from. But the idea is you need to make a network with the same VLAN ID 700 and then Though that will be uh, possible, it will be possible for the API later to import that VM and say it, it should be attached on, the, on this network, not my network backup, uh, but to a specific cloud stack network, which is again same VLAN. So effectively, it's the same network, right? Although it's it's something different. A uh, couple of things. So we have a list unmanaged instances API uh, to list all the instances and details. We have import unmanaged instance API, which will obviously import the single instance. Uh, we also have a discover network uh, This is a Python 3 helper script, which will effectively list uh, all the networks with all the VMs and all the network cards in those networks. Obviously only for networks which do have at least one VM in those networks. So that, that will help uh, automatically pro, uh, or help you to later automa aut automate the provisioning of cloud stack networks before you run the import API. Uh, automatic vSphere to cloud stack network mapping, which I was explaining with the VLAN 700, is possible uh, based on VLAN ID. So uh, if you don't specify a destination network, cloud stack will say, okay, I have a, a source network with VLAN 700, let me search which network in cloud stack within that account has also VLAN 700. And it will automatically do the mapping during the migration. Uh, also, we do automatic IP assigning to a, a network card inside the isolated shared or, or, or uh, period, isolated shared network. Uh, if uh, uh, if uh, VMware tools re uh, reports only a single IPv4, if there are two 
or more IPv4s, we say error, please choose what you like, which specific IP you want to, be, uh, you want to assign to a VM's network card. We are currently not handling IPv6, so if VMware Tools reports IPv6, we say, I have no idea what it is, you know, just simply as, as, as good as it's not there, as, it, as, it, as it's not there. So, uh, there is optional, also, automatic volume and, and VM uh, migration, so we, this means uh, VM live migration and storage live migration or offline if the VM is stopped, if computer and storage tags don't match. So you have a couple of primary storages, uh, VM is existing on primary storage number one, but you want the VM to be imported into primary storage number two based on tags on compute and disk offerings. So effectively, if you specify the parameter, parameter name migrate allowed, then CloudStack will automatically do the VM motion if the VM is running or, or, or simply offline migration to appropriate storage and then uh, make sure that the VM is there. So that's something to kind of, that's also handled properly. Right, uh, time for very, very, very short VM ingestion demo. Um, right, so this is my CloudStack installation. Uh, and I have, oh, all right, so you don't see that, sorry. Right, yeah. <laughs> now, now, now it's a bit better. Right, so uh, again, this is my CloudStack installation. I have one CloudStack created VM. Uh, going to uh, my WeSphere, I'm gonna log in. Uh, assuming my VPN works, right? And you'll observe in a second, uh, you'll observe in a second that, uh, bes why is this so far? Right, be besides some uh, CloudStack VMs, I have also one unmanaged VM. So in that sense, uh, let, me, let me observe this one. Um, it's sent to a state a guest operating system type as chosen, just for sake of uh, further explanation. And <coughs> all right, <coughs> just give me one second to open the console. All right, so uh, I'll be using the API, hopefully. All right, so I'll be using the API uh, to uh, via Cloud Monkey. So what I'm saying here is I want to list unmanaged instances. This is that's how it's split in, in CloudMonkey. I'm defining the cluster ID, exist, the one that exists in CloudStack, <coughs> and that's the one actually which has to be linked or already imported into CloudStack from, from the vSphere. And I'm also uh, listing the specific name, my uh, unmanaged VM. So I'm spe specifying the name of the VM which detail, uh, whose details I want to see. Uh, you can omit the name and then it will give you details of all the unmanaged VMs. So if I hit enter, it will log into vSphere and here you can observe many different things uh, including the root controller disk type, uh, ID of the volume which you <coughs> might be uh, using later, name, uh, uh, adapter type, uh, uh, network name including the VLAN, 1619 uh, and, and so on, including guest operating system type. If I do the import uh, API, if I do the import API, it will be literally like after a couple of seconds or three seconds imported. So uh, again, uh, here for the import API, this is one of the examples how this API could look. It depends what you want to map, if you have multiple disks, multiple network cards, multiple networks for the VM and so on. This is a bit simplified. I'm importing a managed instance. Which one? Well, this one. I'm looking for on vSphere for this specific VM to import. I'm again defining a cluster ID. I'm defining the service offering, which is a compute offering for that VM to be used in CloudStack, and also the disk offering for that specific root disk of the VM. This is only for the root disk. There are additional parameters if you have data disks. I'm mapping uh, mapping uh, IP address of the of the network card in network. Uh, well, network card for, uh, IP to the network card, let's put it that way. <coughs> but I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, allowing uh, CloudStack to work out uh, of mapping the vSphere network to the new already existing CloudStack network. Let me just switch uh, briefly here. Uh, after I see where is my, my mouse. All right, so. So here, if you go to networks, you will see that I have a network. This is an isolated network with a same VLAN, uh, 698. So going back here, you can see all of that existing VM uh, on a completely different network, net 
8.98 or whatever. So I'm, I'm just mapping the IP address, but I'm uh, letting the import API working out to which specific cloud stack network to map a network card from this one. And once you hit enter, it uh, takes literally two to three seconds. Uh, it will do all the database records as needed uh, on many, many different, obviously, uh, tables. And it will return the same output as if you, when you just run the normal de deploy VM. And you will see what's what has been recognized and stuff like that, but let me just briefly show you two things in, in the GUI, it's probably more user-friendly. Going back to instances, now you see that my VM uh, was imported. Um, this VM uh, is running. Uh, the only downside to this is because of VNC configuration, you cannot really consume a console window until you stop and start the VM at least once from CloudStack. But other than that, you can see that the network card is joined to the network with specified uh, VLAN, uh, IP address was the one, uh, actually I need to see what I, what I said over here, but I believe I auto assigned, right, I, I said uh, automatically assign IP address, from, which means from that destination network that you work out yourself. So it, it, it did go effectively to CloudStack and, and saw the actual subnet of, of this specific network and choose a random .70 IP address. Also if you check settings, um, which are VM details, uh, those cannot be changed. But you can see that the network adapter type was uh, correctly recognized, uh, root disk controller was correctly recognized, and uh, also going back to details, it's recognized as CentOS 8, which is a new operating system we added, guest OS mapping we added in 4.13. So it worked, yeah? Sorry? It worked. It worked and it works. <laughs> Until somebody says otherwise. Uh, right, so yeah, that's a short, uh, that's a short uh, demo of uh, the VM ingestion and hopefully you find a couple of things interesting. Uh, now, uh, CloudStack Kubernetes Service. Uh, a lot of abbreviations over here. So, uh, CloudStack Kubernetes Service is kind of, a, we can say, a bit matured or, or native extension or, or, or um, polished and, and, and redesigned uh, what was previously called CloudStack Container Service, which is something that we as a ShapeBlue developed. It was open source, but not, not part of the CloudStack. This was more to manage general kind of clusters, but after the cluster management war was over, pretty much Kubernetes seems to be the way to go for, for most of people. So we say, okay, let's do a proper Kubernetes uh, service, which is effectively a plugin to uh, create and manage Kubernetes clusters. In CloudStack, we're using CoreOS templates for nodes. We are using uh, Cube ADM for uh, cluster provisioning. We're using uh, uh, operator or admin, if you like, provided ISO files to be able to do offline installations of, uh, of Kubernetes and Docker binaries. Uh, we also support gracefully scaling up or scaling down number of nodes, uh, access to the config file for different reasons, and obviously deleting the cluster while also removing nodes, which means the VMs themselves and the service and stuff. So that's an extension now. Uh, there was a, um, uh, actually, this is now to be able from CloudStack to spin Kubernetes clusters. Um, if you would like to Kubernetes clusters to talk to your CloudStack API, in order to open port forwarding rules and stuff like that. Uh, that's something that uh, one of our community friends, uh, Gregor from uh, Swiss uh, TXT, right? Uh, TXT, uh, actually, uh, they were keeping a forked version from the upstream, uh, which is going to now be uh, the cloud stack provider for Kubernetes, which is going to be <coughs> removed soon. So he kept the fork and then finally donated this uh, to Apache project. So this is what will be uh, alone CKS uh, or Cluster Kubernetes service uh, will be available in 4.14. In some of the next releases we plan to do integration of uh, Cluster Kubernetes service and Cluster Kubernetes provider uh, so that we have a complete uh, thing. Uh, Cluster can be used to spin um, Kubernetes clusters and Kubernetes can actually talk back to the cloud stack to open uh, port forwarding rules, create load balancers and stuff like that. So to have really a complete, uh, complete integration. So that's uh, that's it on this one. Uh, backup and recovery again, as I mentioned, uh, we really should be able to to put this one now with all the extensions and, and additional bells and whistles that, that, that we plan for, because there was no rush uh, from any side. So let's do it properly and, and a bit more rich. Uh, the reason uh, for this is because uh, what people are frequently using are volume snapshots. Those are not consistent, uh, consistent as, as as people already mentioned on on the previous talks. The, 
you cannot execute a volume snapshot at the same time you take one and then you have to wait for that one to be finished otherwise CloudStack will not start the another volume snapshot of that same VM for example so if you have um, operating si database you know operating si um, f uh, database files on one disk database logs on another disks good luck trying to restore that so you end up with a inconsistent inconsistent setup so that's one of the benefit uh, it takes forever uh, especially if you're using Ceph there is a very uh, slow export from for some reason but in general if you have a uh, you know multiple hundreds of gigabyte volumes it takes forever um, not to mention but if you're using vSphere that needs to go via secondary storage with GVM to be compressed in OVA and that takes forever two forevers <laughs> <laughs> to say it that way so and also what's also important to understand uh, there's something uh, called executing sequence uh, effectively when CloudStack starts uh, doing the snapshot way if you need to start the VM that VM is also uh, the VM start job is also ex executed in sequence but the previous job in sequence is not finished your CloudStack is being backed up for last three hours and in some cases you won't be able to start your VM simply because of internal logic how things are done locking and stuff like that so it's really awful copying to secondary storage is awful I had personal a lot of pain I do understand some some of you have pain so we are trying to address that um, not to mention restoration in the actual sense of being able to restore from snapshot is again generally not possible there are some improvements now in 411 unfortunately with some let's say garbage left if you delete the snapshot it's not really deleted whatsoever in certain cases uh, so all in all it's, it's a pretty much a pain uh, what we do here, we uh, want to be able to, we have a, a pretty much uh, backup provider agnostic framework with initial implementation for Weem backup product. So uh, that's what uh, can currently be consumed or, or will be able to consume once this feature is uh, done, but new backup providers can be added, no problem. Uh, well, some coding needed, but no problem. Right, so uh, we are here effectively uh, uh, being a uh, trying to, to, to think in a different way, not strictly from the cloud stack. We want uh, to support uh, for you know, policy-based backups. You, know, you in Veeam, you will probably have something or you will maybe plan in advance uh, uh, your policies in such a way that you have different RPOs for six hours, for eight hours, for 24 hours uh, before you are, uh, you are up, and up again and running. Uh, this will be possible to be consumed the also uh, as a scheduled backup, so similar to disk snapshots, but probably much better, and also ad hoc backups. Uh, what we say here is that we want this to be a first class citizen uh, of CloudStack, so it's really tightly integrated and really works fine in contrast to, let's say, volume backup, uh, volume snapshots, which I personally, in my previous company, I have even renamed it the GUI. Uh, I had one of our guys renaming the GUI. Those were actually volume backups. Those were not volume snapshots because at the time it was uh, mandatory to copy to secondary storage. Um, in place restoration of entire VM with all the disks or just some disks as you like. Uh, restoration of deleted VMs as well and also full integration is a cloud stack user service so when a customer deletes the VM that says okay let me restore my VM hopefully the usage will not pick it up sorry it will pick it up so there is no 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 orphaned uh, orphaned uh, VMs in that sense uh, from the billing point of view uh, you can list uh, use the API list backup policies with a switch external uh, equal true which will return all the template jobs from the VM you can also uh, import backup policy uh, uh, use the import backup policy API which will create a policy and assign it to a Veeam template job. Now this does require a little bit of understanding for those of you not familiar with Veeam. Uh, I'm also myself not an expert in Veeam but I'm, I'm aware and I've been playing with that some years ago. But the idea is that you define different RPOs and, and, and you can kind of respect that. So there is no uh, hard-coded time go execute my backup at 12.00. No, you say by the policies I want my data, I want to be able to restore my data after six hours or, or, or to, sorry, to not be able to not to lose more than six hours worth of data. You create different RPOs and then you let CloudStack and Veeam intelligently manage the scheduling of those jobs. So that's the, that's the thing here. Again, ad hoc and scheduled backups uh, all supported. Uh, I'm pretty tight on time, so I won't be uh, going into much details, but it's really something that enterprise users will hopefully value uh, as a feature. Right, uh, time for primary demo. This time I did put it on the center of the slide, so it, it looks nice. Um, right, uh, back to my second, fourth, or whatever screen. Uh, here actually we have a new 
uh, prime degree, uh, this one is constantly R syncing from uh, or whatever kind of way of syncing from repository, so it's always up to date with the upstream code. Uh, takes some time to initially get the screen or to actually log in. Uh, because it's gathering all the APIs available whatsoever to this user, so you can see a like two seconds delay. Now the resolution is not really great, uh, obviously over here, but you can have a dashboard. Uh, uh, right, let me see. Oh, this is better, cool. So this is not code complete. So you will see now some examples. Uh, for computes, you can list instances. Uh, you can maybe uh, spin a new instance, or you know, uh, a uh, couple of things, you, for example, ISO. All right, uh, some of the I, I want to show you some of the missing features, but anyway, uh, this is the whole idea with the GUI. You can go back, it will not log you out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so uh, that's one, one, of, one of the nice things, you know, we try to address a lot of issues with. <laughs> um, well, this is specifically Rocket's work. Uh, he was idle at, at last one year doing nothing, probably. And in, in, he, in his free time, he did a lot of good work. So this has been now accepted to, uh, uh, to become, after voting, an uh, official new, uh, new um, cloud stack GUI. Uh, should, hopefully should be released in 4.14 as a preview. And maybe uh, there will be a transitional period. You have a mailing list. Please check the mailing list archive. You will see what was agreed and voted to be a transition way. So roughly after two years, you will be you will be left with no old GUI. Please keep this in mind and read the mail archives. Just uh, search Apache mailing list for Primate, and you will see a voting process and pre and proposed uh, uh, transition. Let's say schedule and stuff like that. So a lot of things are, are put in a more uh, more beautiful and more uh, functional way. Uh, a lot of uh, things might be missing. Uh, I'm sure something like VPC or something is missing um, or maybe not. I'm trying to si find something that's missing but uh, or was it guest networks? I do recall some of the things, right. So here, here have a pop-up. This is, somebody will pick, from community will pick this up. There are a couple of guys actually already from different companies who are also working together with some of our guys from ShapeBlue. So you have a to-do. Right, so uh, really responsive. Uh, it scales automatically, uh, automatic support for mobile teams. Um, you can uh, even uh, do this uh, in a special way as, uh, I'm not going to say Windows or whatever binary, but local as the desktop GUI, which is connecting to the remote API. So there is a lot of possibilities. Uh, certainly Rocket has much better presentation. You can see our recordings from Vegas and a lot of, a lot of different things, uh, which are really nice. Uh, is some, is you, you can see it there, right? So uh, yeah, that's... So, so this is basically a JavaScript interface with API? Yeah. Uh, this is based, based on Vue.js and some other stuff. But you said I can run it from my own desktop? Is that what you said? Uh, yes, in the, there is a certain setup which you can do to, to run it from your desktop uh, as well. I'm not saying that's something you will need or want to do, but right, it's, it's so technically possible. Translates a UI to an API code. Yeah, service. yeah that's really nice. it's, it's, it's similarly detached from uh, the API, like the previous GUI was, all it was bundled here. This will be, I believe, a uh, separate, maybe even package, or I'm not sure what was finally agreed, but it will be, you'll be able to upgrade on the same version of Cloud Stack to upgrade Primate uh, uh, separately. It's, it, yeah. They are not bounded together. So, yeah, that's... Can you click on the sorry to sure. you go and click on the instance that we have running there? Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I should have probably shown this one. Very, very, very rich, yeah, including very rich. Uh, you know transfer rates, yeah. stuff like that, operating system type. Yeah. Obviously, this is administrator. Probably he, the administrator role is able to see more details that the regular user, but. <laughs> I still have power. <laughs> uh, then the usual one, but it's very, very rich. Uh, those are the VM settings as well, details as if you recall from. I, li I like in the, use in the address bar you actually have the reference to that VM. It's uh, generic uh, URL there. Uh, if yes. If you refresh uh, that, it will still be there. In the old UI, if you, ref if you go and hit enter in address bar, it will take it. The, the old UI is uh, very good enough for rip old UI. So I agree. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, you will be moved to that. But the interesting thing is that the backwards refresh work, stuff like that, that didn't work. Yeah, because the, 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 the yeah. yeah, 
Okay, the, 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 your navigation is kind of reflected in the address bar yeah. properly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much shit. Uh, you can actually check this out uh, on Apache repo and, and, and play with it. And you can file improvement requests and stuff like that. So, please try to actively participate because roughly in two or less than two years old, we will be no more. There will be a long, a long period of maybe one, 1 1.5 years of parallel running of the old GUI and the new one. Uh, at some point in time, we will ac uh, stop accepting new feature improvements in the old UI in the later phase when we are kind of nearly <coughs> to really deprecate it. So, please, any of you doing that custom work. Uh, better try to focus on this one and do that custom GUI work here. So that's just so you don't do it twice, you know, uh, later. All right. Any questions? Related to Seth, something you said earlier and something you said earlier, even can you revert or not? Uh, snapshot. Uh, you're supposed to be able to be uh, in 4.11 because I see that uh, before a certain release, I, I, let's assume 4.11, uh, what I recall when you create uh, a volume snapshot, it's obviously first created in the primary storage, copied uh, back up or copied over to secondary, then deleted from primary. Right. This is not happening anymore. So useful slash garbage, depending on your point of view, a lot of snapshots are left on Ceph, which can influence performance, uh, but that enables you to be able to say, okay, I want to revert, revert to which one? You want to revert directly from the primary storage. That same, uh, that's also true for NFS. So QCAL2 KVM <coughs> NFS also works that way. Uh, you can revert, there is a button and a new API. I believe it's that new API revert. Kind of always works. Uh, it should work, but it's broken <laughs> uh, for Ceph. Uh, uh, some of the Windows guys are taking a look at that, so they will, they will make sure that's fixed. So that's uh, I, can't, I don't need to go to the snapshot. Make yes, it correct. The if you're running KVM with NFS or KVM with Ceph, will eventually work, but right now it's not. It, it's, okay, it's, it's, it's being fixed. With Ceph, it's not yet okay. there. Yeah, okay. It's being fixed in the master, so you are able to just click the button. Right. Mm. The question is machine is imported, uh, will it rename like to be like... The no, 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 it's, uh, we are keeping the original names with all the uh, name constraints that, for example, it, it has, it can contain only this and that kind of characters. You cannot start the VM name with number. So if you try to import VM which says to Andrea, it will fail explaining that, you know, the naming is not good. So you just go and rename the VM. Irrelevant if your data disks are still called in such a name that they start with a number, but the VM itself you just click rename in vSphere and then import it. Um, KVM DX, um, you mentioned that you're doing the balancing based on allocator and not a use. Correct. Is there any reason for that? Because I think if, if I've over allocated and I'm not using, that's actually good if you're provided especially because then you're making better use of the resources. Yeah. Um, and maybe that should be something that should be deployment management or something, but if you actually want to balance load, you should be asked to ask me if it's like a VMware. Uh, okay, so yes, um, uh, the thing with that is, the, you can have two points of view. One point of view is your one, which is perfectly valid. You are saying effectively, why are we, uh, why are we uh, balancing based on the allocated instead of real usage? Or if somebody's hammering a VM, let's migrate it over. The reason is that this is a very, free, they can very frequently change, and we will end up with having uh, line migrations happening during all day. Mm -hmm. That's so the dynamic part, isn't it? That it, it depends how you observe it. It depends how you observe it, but uh, we're trying to distribute evenly. So even if you nail all the VMs after the distribution is even, your host will not suffer unless the cluster is so full and the CPU is so much over provisioned that it will suffer anyway. <coughs> But even if you hammer the VMs, you don't hammer 10 VMs on one host. You hammer five VMs here, five VMs there. The host is hammered for 50%, other VMs can run fine. So that's something that we kind of uh, decided, you know, in, in that direction. Can I suggest, sorry, sorry, sorry again. We, we have, have a bit late. There's tea and coffee downstairs right now for five, five more minutes. When we dive down, grab some tea and coffee. We'll leave this slide right here. <laughs> We've got more time. Let's grab some refreshments, come back, we'll take some more questions yeah. and then move on, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Sure.